Good morning. It's wonderful being with you uh, today as well, uh, this morning as we think about God's work of peace and justice in the world. I just want to note at the beginning that um, it's, it has been such a privilege and honor to be with you uh, during this convention as I make the transition between teaching at the Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary to teaching at Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. I consider this time to be not a farewell, but a, a, a chance for us to continue to build deep relationships between different faith communities, Presbyterians, Anabaptists, Mennonites, Reformed, uh, as we uh, work with God and as we envision ecumenical vision of doing peace and justice in the world. Um, just kind of, uh, you know, the teacher in me wants to remind you of what I've been trying to do the past two days before I jump into the topic for today. So my starting point for uh, our thinking and reflection on peace and justice in the world is that we need to be reminded that we are in a covenantal relationship with God. And the work of peace and justice rests in God's faithfulness because God is a God of the covenant. God is faithful to God's creation and God is at work bringing about peace and justice in the world. This is so important because quite often we feel overwhelmed by the injustices and the pain and the suffering around us and the persistence of evil around us. So we need to be constantly reminded as people of faith that it, it is God's work. But that doesn't mean that we slack off. It doesn't mean that we then don't do anything about it and we just pray and wait upon God. Because as covenantal partners, we are called to participate and to be partners with God in this very important work as we seek to embody it. Interpersonally, as we saw between Joseph and his brothers, as they have reconciled the vision of doing justice, empowering the powerless and those who have been marginalized is never pushed to the side. It's actually central to the work of reconciliation. So justice and reconciliation go hand in hand. But today, as we reflect on the story of the birth of Moses, which is a story about the birth of Moses, but prior to the birth of Moses, and without the work of mighty women who have opposed the tyranny of the king, Pharaoh, we see a system in which People do a very small part, but that small part in the big picture of God's work turns things upside down. So chapters 1 and 2 in the book of Exodus invite us to think about the small parts that we can play as individuals, as a faith community in the world, as we partner with God doing peace and justice. But the book of Exodus chapters 1 and 2 also expose something important that we have kind of experienced in, in a very strong way over the past few years, but it has been operating maybe in uh, disguise, maybe in uh, political correctness, maybe in, in ways where different political systems have kind of covered up for these discourses of xenophobia or ideologies of hatred and fear of the other or oppression. So even though the past few years have kind of like put them to the fore, normalized these kind of uh, 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 ideologies of the fear of the other, they have never gone away. They have been part of the human uh, uh, societies operating in different ways, manifesting themselves in different ways. But the book of Exodus exposes some of those dynamics. How do we get there? What happens when, when a whole society just turns upside down in terms of developing and normalizing these ideologies of fear of the other? So before we talk about how these mighty women resisted tyranny and xenophobia, it's really important to reread these chapters with thinking about how the Bible exposes how xenophobia, the fear of the other, emerges. One of the first immediate things that the book of Exodus notes 
is that a new king rose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And if you remember the, uh, le- the, the ending of the book of Genesis, about 13 to 14 chapters are narrating how Joseph saved Egypt from the famine, how he worked with Pharaoh. Clearly, there was a pharaoh, a a king over Egypt who was willing to empower the foreigner, to listen to the wisdom of the foreigner, even to see the foreigner as an agent of the Spirit of God. When Joseph gave Pharaoh the interpretation of his dream, Pharaoh said to his royal court members, can we find another person who has the Spirit of God in him, like this? And we don't know what Pharaoh meant by the Spirit of God. We're just talking about the Egyptian God. We're just talking about the God of the Hebrews. The text just leaves it open. So the problem is, is not necessarily in the political system. The problem sometimes in the political system that denies that there is goodness that comes from the foreigner, that there is goodness that comes from the outsider, that there is goodness in the other. So I read this phrase that a new king rose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. It's hard to imagine in the flow of the narrative that this pharaoh did not know what Joseph, at least within the the, the narrative itself, have done to Egypt. I read it as there is a new king, a new power, a new system that is denying that there is goodness in the foreigner, in the other, in the outsider. Pharaoh then uses the same exact words that the narrator have used to talk about how God has blessed the Israelites. They became numerous. They multiplied. These words echo Genesis 1, when God commanded humanity to multiply and to be fruitful. So in some ways, the Israelites are living into God's vision for God's creation. But then Pharaoh uses these words in order to turn them upside down from a blessing to a threat. And many populist ideologies we have encountered over the past few years that are afraid of the change of the demographics, where these communities have assumed a dominant culture, and then there is a fear of losing that dominance. In a similar way here, Pharaoh turns this blessing into a threat, into a fear, and then he adds to it this aspect of us versus them. And he even plays into the imaginative fear of people of the other. What happens if there is war? Whom will they join? So you have these hypothetical scenarios that are not grounded in reality, that are being perpetuated and now involving the masses. It's not just a political system and ideology in the mind of one person, but now involving the masses with this ideology of us versus them. Difference becomes a threat rather than a blessing. Fear that is not grounded then turns into processes of dehumanization of the other attempts to control others, to kill life. But that's not the last word. Because even in the midst of this brutal system of fear of the other and attempts to dehumanize the other through forced labor and getting rid of the the Hebrew boys, we hear the story of the two midwives, Shifra and Pua, one named fair or beautiful, and the other means young. And they show us the first incident of civil disobedience, where they do not comply with the demands of the king. And they let the Hebrew boys live and survive. And I just want you, as you listen to how we go through these different episodes, how gender plays a role here. Pharaoh wants to get rid of the boys because to him, girls can live because maybe they are not powerful enough to pose a threat. But then you have all of these stories in Exodus 1 and 2 are about mighty women who were able to actually overcome this ideology of fear of the other. And it begins with two Hebrew midwives or Possibly, as the Greek translation of the Old Testament put it, 
the midwives of the Hebrews. And it's only one vowel in Hebrew that actually changes it from the Hebrew midwives, that is their ethnicity is Hebrew, to the midwives of the Hebrews, which might actually open it up that they might have been Egyptian Hebrew midwives. And the Septuagint, the Greek translation of, of the Hebrew Bible, actually leaves it open, translating it into the midwives of the Hebrews. And there is a Jewish interpretive tradition that actually suppose that they might have been Egyptians. Because why would Pharaoh trust the Hebrew midwives to obey his command? So there is a possibility that they might have been Egyptian midwives. The text leaves it open, and I like actually the translation that would leave it open in order to invite our imagination that resistance sometimes that doesn't just happen from the people of God. Sometimes it might happen from people who are outside of the people of God. Some people around us who also fear God. So the Hebrew midwives or the midwives of the Hebrews, how they ended up resisting the command of the king is that the text notes a couple of times is that they feared God. They feared God. They understand that God is a God of life. That God is a God of dignity, that God created all human beings, no matter how different they are, in God's image, and therefore they deserve to live and thrive. They feared God. Their fear of God exceeded the fear that the king perpetuated of the other. Their fear of God exceeded the fear that the king have perpetuated of the other. The midwives are summoned by Pharaoh and he asks them, what are you doing? <laughs> He's clearly seeing that the Hebrew boys live and, and, and survive and thrive. So clearly his plan is not working. So he summons the Hebrew midwives and he's, as he summons them, they say that the Hebrew women are, are more vigorous than the Egyptian women, because b b before we show up to deliver the babies, they have already given birth. What they do there, whether they are fooling Pharaoh, whether like, you know, uh, uh, lying <laughs> to Pharaoh, whatever is happening there, they use the notion of, of, of difference. Pharaoh used difference as a way of bringing oppression and death. They use difference in order to live in order to cause life to prosper and to overcome death. They make the difference between the Hebrews and the Egyptians as a source of life, not a source of death. It's really striking in the story of the midwives of the Hebrews, how the, they use their, their career, their work, to do such an important work. So doing peace and justice may be about uh, uh, going into marshes, participating in a revolutionary act, doing this massive communal work, but it could also happen where you spend your hours of work and study, where you labor, whether at home or outside of home, whether in a small community or a large community, where, whether in a farm or an office, whether university or a school, what we do day to day can be a, a clear and profound participation in God's work of peace and justice. Can be a place in which we oppose the tide of xenophobia and fear if we are mindful of those who are marginalized in our context where we work, where we live in our neighborhoods, and we reach out to them so that we actually tell them that we welcome and love and integrate the difference, and we are also different. It's not just about us doing this work of hospitality, but we are also being welcomed by those who are different from us. So the work of peace and justice may be grand, may be re revolutionary, but it could be also in the day-to-day -day life as we do our work and participation in the society around us. The other model that we see 
in the Exodus story, chapters 1 and 2, is that this notion that we learn from different uh, uh, marginalized communities that existence is resistance. That sometimes people don't participate in those grand resistance movements. But what they do is that they carry on with their life. Day after day in the face of brutality, of killing, of marginalization, and they just are resilient people. And this is what we see here. You have, you know, Pharaoh involves the people and say, if you see a Hebrew boy, you know, throw it in the Nile. And then you have the story immediately gets into this marriage between this, the, the, the Levite couple. And when Moses' mother gives birth, and the, the, the NRCV translates the text into, she saw the boy as a fine boy. That word is actually tov in Hebrew, which means good. And that, along with uh, the, the idea about multiplying and being fruitful, echoes Genesis 1, where God saw that it was good. Moses' mother and his father participate in this divine creation work that resists, that restores the goodness in the face of the ugliness of evil. She is like God. She sees something good. God saw that it was good. And Moses' mother saw that the boy was fine. That's a fine translation, but it was actually a good, a good boy in the sense of maybe of beauty, maybe of uh, healthy, whatever it is, but, but there is echo of how God saw it, it was good in God's creation. And, and, and that shows us that this, this kind of oppression regimes are actually anti-creational because God's intention from the get-go is for humanity to thrive and oppression tries to control, human oppression tries to control humanity. God's intention is for humanity to have dignity and freedom and sovereignty while oppression tries to dehumanize people. So we see here even in what Moses' mother does, and so does Miriam, they are actually participating in restoring God's creation to its goodness. Existence is resistance. And Moses' mother, ironically, uses the very thing that Pharaoh wanted to use to kill the Hebrew boys to actually give life to Moses. She takes the baby to the Nile. How ironic would it get that she uses the very thing that was used in order to threaten the life of the Hebrew boys. And at that place, at the Nile, shows Pharaoh's daughter with her attendants. And she sees in the basket a crying boy, and she recognizes him immediately to be a boy of the Hebrews. And the text notes that she took pity on him. She had compassion on him. And that, to the, 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 the reader of the text, it cannot get more convenient for someone to do an abhorrent thing. There is a Hebrew boy, and there is the Nile, and there is the creed of the king. But then the, the, the text becomes even more ironic where the, the Pharaoh's daughter, the one who is the, the closest to the, the halls of power, uses her privilege and her power because she took pity, because she used her compassion to deliver and to save a Hebrew boy. Her compassion transcended ethnic boundaries. It made her see the other in a new light, not as a threat, but as a human being worthy of life. So in these narratives, what we see here is we have a group of women from different ethnic and religious and socio socioeconomic backgrounds who resist tyranny. So when we look around, 
the work of doing peace and justice. These texts are actually calling us to, to participate, to do the things that we can do, even if they are kind of like a daily work that we do as a way of resisting tyranny. But they also invite us, maybe even challenge us, to open our eyes to see how other people around us who are quite different from us are participating in this work of peace and justice. This doesn't mean that we do not ground our work of peace and justice in our faith as Christians, but it makes us realize that there is goodness beyond us. That as much as we are called to follow Jesus in doing peace and justice, and as we put Jesus at the center and being inspired by the, by the life of Jesus as we follow Jesus, being empowered by the Spirit to proclaim peace and justice in the world, that we will also be working with people who are different from us, different in, in, even in their religious background, in their faith journey, in their faith walk with God. What is common about these women, though, in their, in their d d different backgrounds is that difference for them was not a cause of fear of the other, but rather a source through which life flourishes. And these words are not just directed towards the world around us where there are ideologies of fear of the other. These are also directed towards us as a faith community because sometimes we fear the other even within the faith community, within the church. We're afraid that we're singing in different languages. We're afraid that we have people who are different from how we think about faith, how we think about our walk with God. People who are different in our midst. Sometimes we are trying as a church too and people of faith, we're trying to create boundaries, not bridges. Sometimes we also fall into this by trying to get rid of difference or thinking that you know, we can reach this idea of purity by marginalizing those who are different from how we think we should be. And we miss opportunities in which God would enrich who we are through this difference that exists within our communities of faith. I want to finish my Bible study as we think about peace and justice with my personal journey as a Christian Egyptian who reads the Hebrew Bible from this cultural location. And I would pause this as, 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 a, as, a, as a question and then also share some, um, um, some parts of the journey that I have um, walked with God as I read the Hebrew Bible as scripture, especially thinking about peace and justice. So I want to invite you to keep this question happening all the time when you read the Bible. How do we enter the biblical narrative? With whom do we identify when we read the biblical text? Do we always identify with the Israelites? What difference would it make if we read the biblical text through the eyes of the Egyptians? What difference would it make to read it through the eyes of the Canaanites? What difference does it make if we read it through the eyes of the Gentiles? Not the Israelites, not the insiders. And that has been a, a part of the journey that I walked with God and I walked with the Hebrew Bible. When I started to uh, uh, started seminary and part of the struggles that I started to experience is how do, I, how do I read the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament as scripture when Egypt is pretty much the bad guy in it? In, 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 like, in my contemporary experience as a Christian Egyptian, I feel marginalized. I, I don't feel like I am, I am like at the center of powers. But every, every time I read scriptures, Egypt is the, the place of power. The memory, the, the constant memory of Egypt as the, the place of slavery, the place of oppression. And that started to stir a very important question for me on how I read the Hebrew Bible as a Christian Egyptian. And, and also, I, I invite you, even if you're not a Christian Egyptian, but to think about that question as how you enter the biblical narrative. How do you relate to po power, power and powerlessness in the text? 
And, and of course, one of the things that I start to realize, uh, this is kind of like a long journey, but when you look at the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus, you have the story of, of Hagar and Ishmael where it's the Egyptian is being oppressed by the Hebrew ancestors, Sarah and Abraham. And then when you enter the book of Exodus, you have the reversal happen, where it's the Egyptians who are oppressing the Hebrews. And in each episode, there is some sort of like oppression happening and an attempt to get rid of that other or to marginalize that other. But then in the story of Joseph that, that I reflected with you on yesterday, I am, I'm kind of intrigued by this idea that when the brothers and Joseph reconcile, Joseph is dressed like an Egyptian man. Joseph is participating in this hybrid space of hybrid identity where he is Hebrew and an Egyptian. And I wonder, like as a Christian Egyptian, where I try to either, like, I either get rid of my Egyptian identity so, so that I would claim the Hebrew Bible as scripture or get of the Bible because the Bible is offensive to me because I want to claim my political identity. I start to realize that there is a space where identity can actually hold contradiction within it. Identity can be multiplicity. Identity have multiple layers. Sometimes I experience to be in a place of power because maybe of my gender, but other places I may experience uh, 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 being powerless because of my faith or because being a minority. And that, in some ways, the story of Joseph as a placeholder between these stories of Hagar and Ishmael, between uh, uh, Hagar and Ishmael and the Exodus story, in the Joseph narrative we see the Israelite community, the authors of the biblical texts are saying that there is some sort of acceptance of otherness within faith identity. When they reconcile with Joseph, they reconcile with their brother, but he's also an, an Egyptian of some sort. And in that, as we think about peace and justice, and I'm quite convinced that many experiences of violence, of oppression, of marginalization, happen around us because we don't know how to deal with difference. Whatever that kind of difference is. And what I've been kind of learning as I try to read the Hebrew Bible as a Christian Egyptian, holding this hybrid identity, is that when otherness, for peace and justice to, to take place, happens, or peace and justice takes place when otherness is embraced and not excluded. When power is used for the sake of the other. And when I exercise self-criticism against the power and the privilege that I have, and however I use it, and when I'm also open to see goodness beyond me in those who are different from me. And as you continue to read the Hebrew Bible, in Isaiah chapter 19, the text ends with, Blessed be my people Egypt, and my handiwork Assyria, and my inheritance Israel. There is in that chapter some sort of a reversal even of the Exodus, because the Egyptians cry out to God and God delivers them. And that tells me that there is nothing lost in the hands of God, even for those whom we think are irredeemable. God continues to work with them, redeeming them and liberating them even from their obsession of being oppressive and oppressors. May it be so. Thanks be to God.